Heavenly Father, we come before you today, as always, Father, just recognizing you and the differences between you and me. You are God and I am not. And we come before you in a posture, even if our body positioning isn't, but we come to you with our hearts bowed and our, our bodies um, coming to you also in submission and humility and just recognizing that you are the one that we bring our supplications to. You're the one that created it all. You're the one that has given us this word and has preserved it and has had it written down by men and you spoke through them and you've preserved it all this time for us to learn from. Um, Father, it is a lot and it's great, but we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, I just pray that you will guide our discussion and help us come to the understanding of things that you would want us to come to. Um, because again, there is a lot and we could just get caught into and bogged down in details. Um, and yet the details are important as well. So we ask that you got our discussion today. Thank you for those that are here, those that may join us in a little bit, those who will watch this later. We just pray for everyone to continue in their study and be diligent um, in the word and that you would not just leave it as knowledge, Father, but that you would help us apply it, bring it to our understanding in a way that changes us and that mm -hmm. we will not leave the same. And we thank you for it all in advance. And we ask for it all in Jesus' name and for his sake as well. Amen. Amen. Did we lose somebody? We lost Diane. Oh, yeah. Hopefully she'll come back. Um, okay. So um, another thing that you can do on your screen, if you want, I'm learning this, is you can actually like click on me and in the dots, it'll say more. And you can make it instead of just gallery view or speaker view, you can make it uh, it's called something else like dedicated speaker or something like that. And then I'll stay big the whole time, but I don't mind I, on my screen. I'm not necessarily doing that. I might need to do that. Um, spotlight view is what it's called. Um, there we go. And then I am spotlighted for everyone. And then you're going to see the board all the time because I realized one week I did a gallery view in the recording and I'm little. <laughs> It's kind of hard to the board when I'm little. So we'll turn this just a little bit so that I have a little more space to stand over here. I did lower my board a little bit to get the glare off of it. I hope that works a little bit better. And um, hi, Lynn. It's good to see that you joined us as well. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> and like I said, if you want, you can mute yourself hi. and unmute yourself if you want to talk. Um, that's, that's something, or you can leave yourself unmuted the whole time. That's okay too, because I do like discussions. Okay, we're going to run through really fast a review because I don't want to spend a tremendous time on that because we have so much to cover. Um, but in our review, as we go through, we're, we're starting with chapter six and seven this week. So in chapter one, we see Jesus going to heaven in chapter, and lots more. In chapter two, we see the Holy Spirit coming down and he comes as a result of Jesus going to heaven because Jesus said while he was on this earth, the helper or the spirit can't come unless I go. So, um, so Jesus goes to be with the father and we know he's at the Father's right hand, and the Holy Spirit comes. And in coming, everything changes. It's a pivotal moment. It's an amazing and incredible moment that has never been like it before. And in that day, um, many uh, that the beginnings of um, literally had something look like touching them and the Holy Spirit came and indwelled them something different than ever before and as a result in that moment they spoke in tongues so that everyone around could understand in their own language but they only spoke as the Spirit moved them to speak. Their numbers were added to that day, many believers, and they began to have meals together, pray together. Prayer is a consistent thing. You looked at that this week as well throughout. In chapter three, you have another miraculous sign wonder event, supernatural event, and that's Peter and John as they go on a normal thing to do, which is to go to the temple to pray on the ninth hour. They see a lame man, a man that's been lame from birth, obviously lame, not tricking anyone, and in the name of Jesus, he rise, they, they call for him to rise and walk, and he does. As a result, 
Peter and John are taken before the council. Now before Peter spoke freely, he spoke on the day of uh, Pentecost as the spirit led him to speak in first in response to the thought that there were, um, that there were the men that were speaking in tongues were drunk and they weren't. Um, and then he gives a history, but he, he points out several things. Number one, he's been told and all the apostles have been told to be a witness to Jesus's resurrection. And he does that. But he also points out to the people he's speaking to there in Jerusalem that they are responsible for turning Jesus over for Jesus to be killed. This pierces some to the, their hearts to where they get saved. And then in, in chapter three, you have Peter speaking before um, the council. And again, he basically says that same type of thing, but the response is not the same from the council. The council gets angry. Um, and then um, that's in chapter four, when they're speaking to the council, each time that Peter, it, Peter seems to be the spokesman. He's not the only one speaking. Sometimes we have an, it'll say the apostles or Peter and John, um, but mostly we see Peter speaking. They're released. Peter and John are released. They go to their companions. Their companions start praying. And as a result of their prayer, the room, the place that they're staying in is shaken. And they begin to speak with boldness because that is what they asked for. And that is what God gave them. Now, for just a second, as because I'm doing this review real fast, but you looked at prayer this week. Um, when you see the prayers that they prayed, why or, or like was there a result was there a response from god yes yes thank you yes there was um we simply put any prayer that i pray or any prayer that you pray can get three possible answers yes no or maybe um, or not now maybe might be a not now um so there might be four if you want to look at it that way um it and that is that's true and that is certainly something in most of these cases they're getting fairly immediate results um but when they're praying what are they praying for um are they praying for things that are frivolous are they praying for things that are selfish are they praying for things that they know from scripture they should be praying for? They, they're praying what they know they should be praying from. They're not, there's nothing frivolous about what they pray. Absolutely. Nothing. And so for us, as we look at these prayers, that's one of the things that we need to be looking at, right? Because in some cases, Kay took you back and showed you, um, like took you to scripture and showed you, but they're praying for something that God has asked us to pray for. <laughs> and we can take from their prayers some, I hope you did that chart on, and the, cause the last column, if you used her chart, you could have done it on your own in your own way. But that last part was like, what takeaway do I get from this? And it's, you know, obviously it's not for selfish gain. It is obviously to put myself in alignment with the word of God, and then God is going to answer it. And at the end of chapter four, we have this living um, with each other, this idea of um, that nothing that they have is theirs alone. As Kay said in her video last week, their possessions didn't possess them. And that is definitely something we need to watch, especially here in America. Um, their possessions didn't possess them. If there was a need, they met the need of the people within that group, the people of the believers. And then we have a specific, we have Barnabas. And then we have the contrast in verse, in chapter five, at the very beginning of Ananias and Sapphira, who did have property, did sell property, but chose to misreport, to try to lie. And Peter called them out and said that they were lying to the Holy Spirit. And they both lied and died that quickly. Yes. Um, very quickly and that brought fear on the church and that brought fear on the people watching what was going on and their numbers are being added to all the time so this is a great big group of people um in in the believers but also that's going to impact more and more people 
in the area of Jerusalem and outside of Jerusalem. We start seeing that people outside Jerusalem are starting to bring people into Jerusalem <clears throat> just so that even Peter's shadow passing might fall on their sick and they're afflicted with demons and so that they be healed. So in the fact that they're bringing their sick, they're acting in faith. They're acting in belief that something positive can come from this. And so we saw last week the idea of doing things in Jesus' name. We saw two weeks ago, actually, the idea of doing things in Jesus' name and the significance of that in the healing of the lame man. But over and over and over, we see that they're told not to teach in his name. So they're, sorry, they're arrested again. They're brought before the council again. This is now two times. And the response is getting worse. The first time they're warned and released. The second time they're warned, flogged and released. What was their response? What, as Peter and John and the apostles went away, what was their response after being flogged? They were, they rejoiced. They were the they had suffered for his name. Yes. Um, incredible, right? It's, it's a very, they, they suffered and they were considered worthy to suffer, worthy. Uh, worthy. which is an incredible way of looking at it, an incredible thing to think about. So um, now that puts us, we're seeing some patterns. We're seeing some things that are the same, but we're also starting to see things are changing as well. Um, their numbers are growing. They are living, you know, going from house to house and in the temple, they're teaching. They were told not to teach. They keep going and teaching. What was their response when the first time and the second time when Peter and John, especially, were told, do not ever teach in this man's name again. Do not ever do this again. What was their response? They said, we have to obey God rather than man. Right. We have to obey God rather than men. Did they take that, and I'm talking Jesus, Peter and James, did they take, sorry, Peter and John, <laughs> did they take saying that lightly? I mean, was this a casual or an arrogant or an in-your-face kind of thing? No. No. No, it was respect for God. That's how I looked at it. Very much so. And I believe they even respected or showed the honor worthy of that role, the, the, the council, that position. I think they respected the position and even how they addressed it. But they were also just very blunt and said, yes. you know, we can't do what you're telling us to do. They have marching orders. Jesus has told them to do this, right? Okay. So that there's so much more, <laughs> but that's what uh, we saw coming up in starting into chapter six. And even at the beginning, it says at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, there, there is a little complaint that comes up. So you've got this group of people that are meeting regularly, going from house to house. They're sharing property. They're sharing meals. They're sharing prayer time together. And as a result of all this shared time, this problem arises. What was the problem? The widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. Certain widows, not all the widows. Oh, yes. 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 So it's the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews. Um, you, Kay gave some background and helped you understand a little bit about these Hellenistic Jews, but they came, even when you went back to chapter two, they came from all parts of the earth back to Jerusalem and were there. Um, Hellenistic is the idea of the Greek uh, culture that is, at the time that we're looking at, the Roman Empire's in charge. The Greek Empire was just one prior to it. The Roman Empire took over the Greek Empire. And the Romans basically just absorbed it. Um, and they allowed for the Greek culture to continue in their, their Roman Empire. Um, so a lot of people would have been considered Hellenistic, meaning they were from that Greek culture. 
So these Hellenistic Jews had that complaint against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Is this okay? No, not if you're all one, one accord. Right. It's not fair. <laughs> We're going to use the F word. It's not fair, right? Um, it's not fair, and it's, it's not right, if you're of one accord, that there should be no partiality, right? Um, right. But, but even more so, what is the provision that God gave to widows? What is the, you looked up some verses. What were, what were we, what do we know about widows? I didn't get I, that. It goes all the way back to Ruth. Yes. It goes all the way back to the law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were specifically told that, well, let's just think the groups of people, the groups of people that God specifically told them over and over and over again to take care of included widows, but it also included who else? Or Orphans, orphans. and um, the aliens, the foreigners yeah. in, with, among them. Oh, yes. This, okay. It said so, is that with the sojourners? That would be a sojourner. That would okay. be a sojourner is someone who doesn't own property. Okay. Isn't there, that might be journeying there, but so for instance, Abraham was called a sojourner. And so the idea is this is not my property, but I'm living here. Weren't they just like temporary workers or people traveling uh, through? They could be any of those things. Yes. Um, they could be potentially, I guess. Well, anyway, they were aliens. They were not Hebrews. Let's just put it that way. They were not Jewish. Um, they were uh, sojourners or aliens among them. Now, of those three groups, you've got widows, orphans, and aliens within the land of Judah, of Israel. That's where they would be talking about. What would you hold in common between those three groups, and why would they need to be provided for? They didn't have anybody right there that was like your family because I read in some of that that if you had a widow that was in your family that we should be taking care of that person. Yes. So to me these people didn't have someone that would be of their family that would help to take care of them. Very much so. Okay and also add in in this time uh, not so much now, but in this time, a woman could not provide for herself. Yeah. You know, the men could provide for themselves and for their family, but a woman could not provide for herself, or it would be very difficult for her. She could do small things, but it would be very difficult. So a widow is a very vulnerable person. Okay, and what you were talking about Cindy is in actually is in the New Testament, but you looked it up this okay. week, and that was the idea of classifying widows. So yes. there were widows that had support. Yes. If, if I had someone in my family, let's say my mom, but my mom is a widow. If I had my mom, instead of saying the church needs to take care of my right. mom or somebody else needs to take care of my mom, I need to take care of my mom. That's my, and not maybe just me, but still, I would need to have that responsibility. And in the case that we read about, it specifically said, don't, so that they're not a burden to the church. Okay. So you see this criteria. It also said young widows needed to remarry. Yes. And there were some good reasons for that, but partly because in the, in the marriage, they would be provided for. Um, but also because it would keep them occupied and they could have children and they wouldn't be running around with too much time in their hands right. and getting into trouble. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were widows that were what they call widows indeed, meaning they had no support system. And that's where the church would come in. That's where in this case, where you have this communal group of people, they would be needing to take care of the widows and therefore in this moment, as they're uh, having these meals together, these widows 
are part of it and there would be provision for them. There'd be provision by the food. Um, but apparently there were some being overlooked. They were not being preferred or whatever. So this came to the attention of the 12, which is the apostles, remembering that Matthias re replaced Judas. So there's 12 of them again. And um, they came up with a plan. And their plan was that the 12 needed to devote themselves to what? Um, preaching and the word of God. The ministry of the word and a prayer. Yeah, avoid prayer. Yeah. Okay. And so if they're dedicating themselves, devoting themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, which would be teaching the word and, and learning and teaching the word, um, that means that stopping and waiting tables is taking them away when, from their primary task, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And they determined that wasn't a good thing. So they determined what was the solution to the problem? Choose some men who, who could do that from the church. Very good. The and how many did they choose? Seven. 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 And what was the criteria? Um, was it full of faith? Full of with spirit. With spirit and wisdom. And of wisdom. And of good reputation. And good reputation, yeah. Remember, people are watching them all the time. So even outside this congregation, the people of Jerusalem are, are watching. So it's important that they be of good reputation. And if you flip back a couple of pages, you see that, that this group of believers were found favor with everybody. And then over time, people still respected them and liked them, but they didn't associate with them because things were getting a little more harsh. You know, things were starting to turn against them, but they were still highly regarded. So here, these men would need to be among those that are highly regarded or of good reputation and full of the spirit and full of wisdom. Now, I want to ask you, what task are they going to perform? <laughs> Serving tables. Serving tables. <laughs> Or specifically widows, but for really pretty yeah. much everybody. Okay. Yeah. Would that be the criteria you would find necessary? Okay, let's just, just step back for a second. The problem arose because in this group of people where humans are involved, it, things weren't being fair. So if you had seven men that were full oh. of wisdom and full of the spirit, and of good reputation, what do you expect from them? They're gonna take care of everyone. Yes. Fairness, equality, yes. impartiality, they're gonna do the right thing, right? And, and there's another thing that's involved in this. If these men are appointed to do this task, this task is probably gonna get done. Have you ever been in a group where their, their roles are not defined? How much gets done when nobody really knows what their role is? It becomes kind of confused. Things, uh, a bit of confusion happens. It, there's confusion and pretty much everybody sits around and wonders why, isn't thing, why aren't things getting done and who's in charge and it's very confusing and fingers might get pointed. And especially because I have children and y'all have probably had children. If you just tell your children the house needs to be clean. They're going to look at each other and see who else is going to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Instead of stepping Probably up and doing it. Do that sort of thing. It's, it's group think. It's the way that, that, that ends up happening. So in this group of seven, there is a specific one mentioned that we're going to begin to talk about. And who is that? Stephen. Stephen. So we can list, um, I really am leaving my board because I really want to get to what Stephen says, <laughs> but these things are important too. What do we know about Stephen? What, what is his description? And I'm going to write it down and then I'm going to erase it again. So what do we know about Stephen? Full of grace and power. 
full of grace and power. What else? Faith in the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, mine says faith. Um, full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Okay. We also know that he's of good reputation because of the original, right? Right. right. It's a good rep, and he's full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit, which we've already read. Um, <clears throat> and then after this, as we begin to see more about him, now also the apostles laid their hands on them and prayed over them. And you looked in scripture and you saw this idea of laying on of hands. This may have been the first time you've really ever gone and looked at that, or maybe not. But it's, it's something that a lot of times is practiced, but we don't really even know the origin. And you saw this week that there really is an origin. And it mm -hmm. goes back even to when um, Moses was going to appoint Joshua in his place, and God told him to. So in the laying on of hands, like from Moses to Joshua, what does that indicate? Is there like a magic to it? No, it just shows them. It just shows that God. Um, I think didn't it say that? I believe it said that God told Moses to point Joshua, and um, God directly told Moses to point. Uh, he, he told him. He told him to tell Eleazar the priest to, that, that he was going to appoint Joshua, and then um, and then Eleazar laid hands on him. Right, and that. And that was just the, from God, it showed, the, it showed the power that God was going to instill, that it came from God, that he gave him the, let the people know that this man was God's next choice. Right. So from one to the other, I mean, if you thought of this as a relay race, it would be the baton pass. Yeah. It would be, I have it, now I'm giving it to you. It's not necessarily any sort of magical thing. It's basically usually a visual thing of a, a from the authority of Moses over to the authority of Joshua, that this is the chosen one. This is the, and I don't mean chosen one like Jesus, but I mean, this is the one chosen to take the next to the role. It would be similar to one king like David saying Solomon is my son that's going to be the next king because Solomon had a whole bunch of king, sons. So it would be that, that specific dele, dele, delegation. <laughs> that's the word, word yeah. I'm trying to think of. So in this case, the apostles laid their hands on these seven men, visually showing the group of people. This is, these are the men. In this group, you've got Stephen, Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parna, Parmenas, and Nicholas, and a proselyte from Antioch. So this is a diverse group among them, and some of them are Greek, by the way. So you think those Greek women might be taken care of now. Those Hellenistic <laughs> Jews might be taken care of. Um, and then they prayed and they laid hands on them. And then it says, then it shifts. The word of God continued spreading. The number of the disciples continued to increase. Then it starts focusing in on Stephen. It says he's full. This is where it says he's full of grace and power. Um, he is doing what? Great wonders and signs among the people. Yes. He's performing signs and wonders among the people. Um, and he's also speaking, right? He's teaching, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yes. And there's a group of people that come up against him. Who are they? Oh, the synagogue of freedmen. Synagogue of freedmen. Synagogue represents means Jews. It's a it's a like a like we call it a church, but it's a group uh, that meet together. Um, there's a certain criteria involved in that, but they're Cyrenians, Alexandrians, Sicily, and Asia rose up and argued with Stephen. So they're arguing against Stephen. Now, remember, Stephen is full of wisdom. Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit. 
Stephen has a great reputation. Stephen is teaching the truth. And he's been specifically selected, in this case, to help wait tables, but he's been selected. Um, and as a result, this, as they rose up and argued against Stephen, they couldn't, what? What was the problem between them? Well, they didn't have the, the evidently, or they didn't have the Holy Spirit. Stephen was speaking, Stephen was speaking through it with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was giving him the wisdom to speak. Right. And these men evidently were not believers, so they didn't have the Holy Spirit to, to give them the words to speak. And as a result, they were arguing they couldn't cope with, they couldn't argue really with what Stephen had to say because he was so full of wisdom and the Holy Spirit. And so what did they do? What did this group of men do? They secretly instigate gated trouble. Right. They incited the people. Yeah. And, and, and what did those people do? Just tell me the and story. They also incited the church leaders, the priests and the, and the, and the um, scribes and the, the church leaders. Well, they're not church leaders. Well, they're the Jewish leaders. Well, yeah, elders and... <laughs> I mean, church is, is of Jesus. So they're, they well, added the, leader, the leaders in Jerusalem. Which is, yeah, synagogue leaders. Some right. of them in the right. synagogue. The yes. Sanhedrin, the council, the leaders <laughs> over Jerusalem, the, the uh, yeah. religious leaders and political, basically, leaders. They brought them, dragged them in front of the council. Right. Right. Okay. So this is where we really want to look at what are the two categories of charges against Stephen. That he was blasphemous words against Moses and God. Okay. And I'm just putting Moses and God up there, but what you said is absolutely right. Yeah. The categories separate between, basically between that supposedly he was blaspheming Moses and he was blaspheming God also. And they went a little more specific and they said that he was claiming, he repeatedly said that they, that they were gonna alter the customs of Moses. So that would be the blaspheming against Moses and that they were going to um, destroy the temple. Yes. Okay. Now you looked back in Old Testament. If someone truly did blaspheme God, what was the law in regards to that? What should happen to that person? They were stoned. Should yes. be stoned. They should be killed. Right? Mm -hmm. Keep that in mind. If they're right about Stephen, he should be stoned. Right you know what happens to Stephen, so just hang on to that thought. But they brought false witnesses. Yes. You also looked up this week, what should happen to a false witness? How, what does God view a false witnessing and what should happen to a false witness? Well, there has to be two witnesses that see the same from what I went back and looked at. You have to have two that saw the what was that what was wrong yes that was uh -huh. one thing and i thought that was important that i you know because when i look at some things that have happened where you only have one person that might and it could be that they just are out to get that person right. so they had rules of how you how you had to address this yes on the basis of at least two or three witnesses no it yeah. could be more but at least that um a person oh. could be Accused. Sorry. So, I said it said the judges had to investigate it thoroughly. Yes. And the judges had to investigate it thoroughly. Now, you have to understand this group, this council, the Sanhedrin, would be standing as judges. They would be the judges of the people. Right. They would be the ones that would know the law, would be educated in the law, and would be able to not only know that there needs to be two or three witnesses, but they would know what the law said in regards to whatever the accusation was. Right. 
Okay. Now we also just going to remind ourselves this same group of men, this council, which includes priests and, and chief priests, meaning the high priests and others of, of high priestly descent, the elders, the scribes, the Pharisees and Sadducees. It's, it's a big group. I mean, it's a, it's a very powerful, very important group of people. That same group of men just a couple of months before this, three months maybe before this, what did they do? Who was in front of them? Jesus. 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 Same group. Same group. And Peter's message twice to this same group prior to this, prior to Stephen, is you killed Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. He's the chosen one of God. God raised him. We're witnesses to that. Remember, witnesses to the resurrection. Peter spelled it out to this group. The first time they warned and released, second time warned, flogged and released, and now we've got Stephen. Now we've got Stephen in front of them, charged with blaspheming Moses and blaspheming God. These are big charges. This group of people have been told, stop teaching in Jesus' name. They're saying we can't stop. We've got to do what God is telling us to do. And angels specifically release them from prison and say, go to the temple and teach. And they're saying, you're trying to put the blood of this man, Jesus, on us. But the blood of Jesus was on them because they said, we accept that when they called for his death. Mm -hmm. So this group of men, this group, this council. Okay, so Stephen has been accused of these two things. And so when you go through Stephen's speech, you have to hear and find how Stephen addressed this. He doesn't stop and say, I didn't blaspheme Moses. I didn't blaspheme God. I didn't say this. I didn't say that. That's not how he does it. And we can see a pattern in this. We can see some help in this. First, and one of the things he does is he talks about men. Giving what? What is overall his message about? What's he using? He's using the Torah. He's using the Old Testament. Yes, the Torah, as you said. He's using their shared history. Okay, they've said, You're, you've blasphemed Moses and God. You're speaking out against the temple. You're speaking out against the customs that Moses gave us. And this is what Stephen did say. This is what Stephen talks about. So he starts with Abraham. And in talking about Abraham, we cannot give all the details. But in talking about Abraham, he tells about Abraham was in a place called Mesopotamia. And uh, God told him to leave your country and go to the place I'm going to tell you to go. And he leaves and stops in Haran. And then as his dad dies, he goes into the land. He leaves the land of the Chaldeans and he settles in Haran. And then God removed him from Haran and took him to the land in which they are now living. This is the land that God had promised. And he gave it as, as an inheritance to the people he's talking to. But he says, uh, uh, Abraham had no inheritance here. That's the sojourner part. He lived here. He lived in tents. He bought one piece of property, and that piece of property was to bury his wife. And later, it buried, that's where Abraham was buried. In um, but he was promised by God that this would be a possession for his people. But it also talks about in Abraham. So he's told to, he's told to go. And he's told to stop. He's told to go and he's told to stop. <laughs> Sorry, I'm really paraphrasing here. And he does go, but he has no inheritance. Somebody needs to mute because we're hearing a lot of background noise. Um, and then it says, um, he was going to be, they, he gave him a prophecy, right? God gave Abraham a prophecy. What did that prophecy include? Um, he, he, he promised that land that um, he would give a, a possession. Mm -hmm. uh, he would give him a child. And, right. 
And, yeah. and that's absolutely true. That's not exactly what we're talking about right now, but he did promise them the land. And, and that was in the original call of Abraham. That's in Genesis chapter 12. But if you go on in this narrative, he tells him a prophecy, and that's at the point of God making covenant with Abraham. And uh -huh. in the prophecy, the prophecy includes that they're going to be what? Aliens. They're going to be aliens in another land. They're going to be in bondage. They're going to be slaves. Um, oh. And then... Yeah. And then God's going to take them out, right? God yeah, he brings them back to the land, right? He tells them where they're going to be. Right. So there's a prophecy, okay? And then this is the next person that Stephen talks about is Joseph. Mm -hmm. And in talking about Joseph, he talks about how they ended up in Egypt. Now, part of his story is that Joseph, Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. What was their motive? Jealousy. Jealousy. Okay. His brothers were jealous, sold Joseph into slavery. We know the story. It's a wonderful story. We can't get into it now. But they went, Joseph went, and later Jacob, or his father, whose name was changed to Israel, and all of his brothers ended up in Egypt in a good situation during a famine, but, and a provision and everything else. But then another Pharaoh rose that didn't know Joseph and put them into bondage. Ding, ding, ding. Just like God said. And they're in bondage for hundreds of years, like 430 years, I believe it is. As a result, God saw them, God heard them, and God remembered his promise and he brought them out and brought them back to the promised land in the, but who did he use to do that? Moses. Right. He used Moses. Okay. Great story here about Moses, by the way, some information you've never heard before about Moses is right here. And for instance, that when Moses killed the Egyptian, for one thing, it says Moses had, um, he was educated in all the learning of the Egyptians. He was a man of power in words and deeds. And when he was about the age of 40, when he was approaching 40, it entered his mind to visit the brethren, his brethren, the sons of Israel. And when he saw one of them being treated unjustly, he defended him and took vengeance for the oppressed by striking down the Egyptian. And he supposed that his brethren understood that God was granting them deliverance through him, but they did not understand, okay? So, um, they did not understand. Now, they did not understand when Moses was about 40 years old. As a result of this incident, and the, the, and the next day there was a, an altercation, they disowned Moses. They rejected him. His own people rejected him. He left and he went to Midian, and he was in Midian for 40 years. So now he's about 80 years old. God speaks to him in the burning bush. We know this story. It's a wonderful story, but... God says, I'm going to send you back. I'm going to send you back, and you're going to bring the people out of Egypt. And, and Moses is going, why would they listen to me? Um, you know, who am I? Um, and God, and Moses also says, during his time in the wilderness, he says that God is going to raise a prophet. God is going to raise a prophet like Moses, okay? We saw this in Acts chapter 3 in part of Peter's message because Peter makes it clear who that prophet is. That prophet that Moses was going to raise up like Moses is Jesus himself. They, this group of men have already heard about this from Peter. Now they're hearing about it from Stephen, brought together in a little bit of different way. Now, when 
Stephen is telling this story about Moses, he talks about the, the fathers, the patriarchs, the, the group of people that are the predecessors to this council, to the, all the Jewish people that are wandering in the wilderness with Moses. What was their relationship with Moses? They've already disowned him. What do they do when they're in the wilderness? Do they listen to him? No. No. They're disobedient, right? And they're idolatrous. Okay, I'm picking out specific things. There's a lot here. Um, but I want you to see that when Stephen is telling this story, you've got a group of men saying, you, Stephen, have blasphemed Moses and you've blasphemed God. We would never do that. Did it mean, um, I, I, I that when it said, uh, it was not to me that, when God says, it was not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices for 40 years in the wilderness that, um, along the, in other words, they went ahead with their, they, they, they put their idol worship along with the tabernacle worship. Idolatry. Yep. Okay. They had the calf that they made, Moloch, that they were sacrificing to. They brought gods from Egypt. They brought a lot of their practices from Egypt. And um, it even said that God removed that you know, remove them to Babylon because when they got into the land, they continued this idolatry. So we don't have that place else in the Bible, do we? I'm sorry? That's no place else in the Bible, is it, that they had the, that they did that in the wilderness. I don't remember ever reading that any place in the Old Testament. Well, we do know about the calf. We know about we that. And other yeah. practices. Yeah, there's, there's other places where, um, they go Balaam, Balaam got the, I uh, forgot which group of people, to get them to start worshiping gods with them. So wow. yeah, there is idolatry mentioned, and I've just read it recently, so it's familiar. They, but there's idolatry mentioned in the, in the Exodus account, and Numbers and Deuteronomy and Leviticus. Um, read oh, those. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's very clearly spelled out here. I just yeah. want you to see the group of fathers <laughs> and what right. they're capable of. Um, and then you've got, um, you've got the continuation of the story of Moses, but it starts talking about the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, right? Mm -hmm. Where was it? Where did they get it? Well, the pattern was given to them in Deuteronomy. Right. The pattern was given to Moses, and it was while they were in the wilderness. Um, sorry, I almost fell off my stool. Um, that it was given to them in the Moses, it, given to Moses while they were wandering in the wilderness. And this was pa a pattern God had given. Um, and they carried it around with them, and then they brought it into the land with Joshua, right? And they also had the Ten Commandments. Yes, they had the art. They had they had the furniture, and they had the Ten Commandments and the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, um, they had all of that. They brought the tabernacle in to the land, and as and while in the land, um, it shifts to now David, um, and really David and Solomon, because. Now we go from the tabernacle of testimonies to what structure? The temple. Right, the temple. The temple that Stephen is being accused of claiming that he was gonna tear it down or they were gonna destroy it, which would be blasphemy in their eyes to say that you were gonna tear down the temple of God. Okay, problem is they didn't view the temple correctly. Even 
the tabernacle that was given as a pattern to Moses and the temple later that was on David's heart to build. And God said, you're not going to build it. Your son's going to build it. And Solomon built the temple. It took him seven and a half years. Just read these chapters, by the way. And Solomon prayed as he dedicated the temple. And in praying in the dedication of the temple, the Shekinah glory or the cloud of God actually filled the temple so much that the priests had to leave it. They couldn't stay inside it. And Solomon is outside, outside by the altar, and he's praying. And as he prays, he says all of these different times that if they sin, if they're in another country because God has removed them, he gives it all these scenarios. He said, if we will look to this place and pray, position ourselves towards this place. So you go to Daniel and you see Daniel positioning himself to look into the Western direction as he prayed three times a day. He was accused of it. He actually got arrested for it. Um, but if they will pray back to that, that place towards their, you know, looking towards that place, that's what Solomon prayed for them to do. But Solomon also said the same thing God said. When David had it on his heart to build the temple, it says right here that God said, heaven is my throne. Mm -hmm. The earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what place is there for my repose? By the way, was it not my hand who made all these things? So they're counting on the temple. But where is God's dwelling? In heaven. Right. Heaven is where God's throne is. No building can contain him. And for Solomon's temple, the Shekinah glory did come. For the tabernacle, the Shekinah glory did come, visibly God's presence. But when they were taken into captivity into Babylon, the Shekinah glory lifted and left. When they returned from Babylon and they restored the temple and later Herod enhanced it, the Shekinah glory never came to the temple. That visible presence of God never came back to the temple that they're right now claiming that Stephen has blasphemed. But God walked into the temple. And how did they treat him? They rejected him. They rejected him. Just like they disowned Moses, like the fathers disowned Moses. They rejected Jesus. Did not see him for who he was. And they're making a big deal about this temple and whatever Stephen has said. Now, we also looked. This same statement about the destroying of the temple was said about Jesus. It was the same false accusation against Jesus. So you've got these parallels with Jesus and Stephen. You've got the false witnesses at his trial, same as Jesus. You had the, this particular statement being made. This man claims that he's going to tear down the temple and rebuild it in three days. That's what they said about Jesus. Uh, Stephen, they just said, this man claims they're going to destroy the temple. What had Jesus said? What was the truth of that statement? Had he said, I'm going to destroy the temple? Had Jesus said that? I looked it up this week. I think he just said he would, he could rebuild it in three days. He said, you will destroy this temple. I will raise it in three days. And he was speaking about his body. They took that, that they did not understand and they made it an accusation against him and against Stephen. But it was not, it was taken out of context. It was not understood. And that is never what Jesus said. Just keep that in mind. Jesus did say 
you will destroy this town. I'm pointing to myself, but I'm not Jesus. <laughs> Jesus was saying it. You will destroy this temple, my body. He didn't add the my body part. That's what he meant. He said, and I will raise it in three days. And he was talking about his body. Did they destroy his body? They killed him. Did he raise it in three days? He did. And even then, they're still accusing Stephen of this false statement. Okay? So when Stephen goes through this account of all this history that is shared with them, they don't have a problem until, until he starts calling them certain things. He calls them what? What are the names? Um, uncircumcised in heart. Stiff-necked. Yes. Stiff-necked, uncircumcised of heart and ears yeah. and what else resisting the holy spirit mm -hmm. he also says that they are betrayers and murderers of the prophets Who, who told of the righteous one to come. Yeah. Basically, he says, you're just like your fathers. That's the reason I wanted to put some of this up here. Okay. What we've seen it in a previous chapter. What is their motivation? Jealousy. Where was it? Jealousy. Just like Joseph's brothers. They disowned the one that God sent to deliver them. They disowned Jesus. They disowned the prophet that God raised up, just like Moses. So they disowned Moses, but they also disowned the prophet that God raised up, just like Moses. They, these prior to them, murdered all the prophets that God has ever sent that were going to declare the righteous one, the Christ, Jesus. And these are doing the same thing. They're, they're now being lumped in with the ones being betrayers and murderers. Okay. Jesus himself is a prophet for himself. And they murdered Jesus. So they're lumped in to the murderers and the betrayers. And this is what Jesus, and they're stiff necked, they're obstinate. You saw that in the account that you looked at in the Old Testament. God was done with them several times and called them obstinate or stiff-necked and said, I'm not even going to go with you anymore. You just go on. I'll still give you the land. That was unconditional, but I'm not going with you. Moses kept having to intercede on their behalf, which is something Jesus does, by the way. Their reaction in this account, their reaction was pierced, were they not pierced, sorry, they were cut to the quick, which is before we saw that mean they were enraged. They gnashed their teeth. That is a, that is a really strong, they gnashed their teeth. I mean, they literally were so angry and he was so full. Stephen was so full of the Holy Spirit. We already saw that right as he began speaking to the council, they looked on his face and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Now don't picture cherubs, little fat babies with wings flying around. <laughs> that is not what an angel would look like. If you and I saw an angel, a real live, you know, serious angel, it would scare us. So his face though was just, just I can imagine it just shining. It just, there was a, that wisdom was pouring forth from him. And he was calm and he, he spoke to this council with this wisdom and this power and he was full of the spirit and full of grace and power, as it said. And they were cut to the quick. They gnashed their teeth and he gazes to heaven and he sees the glory of God and he sees Jesus. He sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Where did Jesus say he was going to go? Father. He was going to go to the Father, and he, we saw it in a passage that you looked up this week. Jesus told them when they said, when the high priest looked at him in his trial and said, are you the Christ? He said, 
I am. And you will see me seated at the right hand of the Father. What is he doing now for Stephen? He's standing. standing. It's significant to understand that he's still at the right hand of the Father, but he's not sitting when this is going on with Stephen. He's standing and he's looking at this. And Stephen gets to look up and God reveals this to him. And then Stephen says it. And he says, um, behold, I see the heavens opened up and the son of man. So he's named Jesus, the son of man, standing at the right hand of God. And they cried out with a loud voice. They covered the ears. They didn't want to hear it. They rushed on him with one impulse. They drove him out of the city, which would have taken a little while. We're not talking about they just killed him on the spot. They pushed him outside the city and they began stoning him. Now, the reason they pushed him outside the city is the same reason that back in the law with Moses, that they were taken outside the camp when they stoned somebody. They didn't want that within the city or within the camp in the case of the wilderness. But so they pushed him outside the city and they stoned him. And then you see this man named Saul and the robes are being put down. And we know a little bit about Saul. We're going to learn, learn more about him later. And they kept on stoning Stephen. And then there's two more things that are parallels to what happened to Jesus. What did Stephen do? He asked Jesus to do what? Two things. To, to forgive them because they don't, they don't know what they do. Well, that's what Jesus said to the Father on the cross. Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. And Je Jesus said to, I mean, Stephen said, forgive them. Don't hold this sin against them. He asked them to forgive them. And the first thing he asked was to receive his spirit. And yeah. Jesus said to the Father, I commend to you my spirit. So there's parallels. Jesus and Stephen's not Jesus. I'm just saying that there's his, his guide. And Stephen did a very similar thing. This is a very powerful moment. Yes. And we know that Stephen is the first martyr. That's what we're seeing here. Things are ramping up. Do you think that when Stephen was given this message to the council, that he did not understand what was going to happen or what the stakes were? Remember what Stephen was full of. The Holy Spirit, power, and wisdom. So when Stephen says this, because I guess my question is this, an application. If you were in Stephen's shoes, would you have pulled the punch? Or would you have told the truth? Would you have called them stiff-necked? Remember, stiff-necked, uncircumcised, they see themselves as circumcised. Where is it? Um, with Moses. Sorry. I'm sorry, it's with Abraham. <laughs> I didn't write it up there. Um, circumcision was introduced with, with Abraham. They're uncircumcised. They're counting on these things. They're Jewish. So they're counting on, and it also says of them, and I didn't write it, that they receive the law, but they're not doing the law. They accused him of altering the customs, but they're the ones that are doing that. So if they were right, Stephen deserved to be stoned, but they weren't right. And he was stoned anyway. Do you think that God could have stopped it? Yeah, yes. because another parallel that I saw too uh, between what what it said about uh, Jesus standing um, when Stephen looked up it, it back um, when he was talking about Moses, because um, he says um, on thirty four. Yes, it, uh, he says um, the Lord said to him. When he was stand, when he was in the burning bush, yes, um, he says he said, and I have I have seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. Right, I have heard their groans, 
and have come down to rescue them. Come now and I will send you to Egypt. So to me, I thought that was a sweet thing that I've seen it, I've heard it, and I'm going to rescue them. Yes. But they didn't want to be rescued. Yeah, that yeah. was the weird thing. They did. They didn't want to be in slavery anymore. But as soon as they got in the wilderness, they kept complaining and saying, we huh. want to go back. Um, and it, it was just kind of like this, as Stephen is saying. I mean, um, Jesus came. He, he rescued them. But they didn't want to be rescued. Right. And so, so Stephen's looking up and he sees that Jesus is rescuing him and he, he wants it. He's, yeah. he's full for that rescue. You're right. You're and right. he sees Jesus looking, you know, he looks up and he sees it. And I, to me, that was a really kind of significant thing. And just realize that if you find yourself in a situation, if, if any of us ever found ourselves in a situation similar to Stephen's, and if we stood on the truth and if we allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to us, even if that led to our death, Jesus is standing. He's not taking it lightly. He's there for us. And immediately, Stephen's spirit would have been received. Yeah, this is a bad thing. Being stoned is not a good thing. Having these people reject you to this level is not a good thing. But ultimately, Stephen is known for this. And we just have to ask ourselves, would we do the same? Or would we, even in what we're told all the time, you know, you know when, when we're told speak the truth in love, basically we're usually being told be nice. And I can't see what Stephen is saying here as being perceived as nice. <laughs> and yet, it's the truth. And anybody that would witness, watch this and hear this and know this, hopefully would be converted. They have the opportunity, instead of being cut to the quick, they had the opportunity to be pierced in their hearts, like those first believers, the first set of believers at Pentecost that came into belief, is they received the word. And this group just keeps on and keeps on and look how many opportunities they've had already to hear the truth. They heard it from the truth, Jesus. And now they've heard it from Peter and John at least twice. And they've heard it now from Stephen. And they're just getting harder and harder. And more stiff-necked, sorry, more stiff-necked. More uncircumcised of ears and heart. They're not willing to hear. Well, we're